Welcome, fellow explorers. My name is Christian Alexanderson, and this is Hemlock Style Hellbenders, a podcast highlighting Pennsylvania's parks, forests, and great outdoors. That distinctive sound is elk bugling. The high-pitched sound comes from the male elk that bugle during the breeding season to attract potential mates and to establish dominance. It's the sound of these bugles and the sight of these majestic creatures that brings more than a half a million visitors to north-central Pennsylvania every year, specifically to Elk State Forest. And while Elk State Forest is a secluded area most of the year, it's inundated with people from late summer through the fall that are in search of the largest free-roaming elk herd in the northeastern United States. One look at these amazing animals and you'll understand what all the fuss is about. They are a sight to behold. A mature elk called a bull stands 50 to 60 inches at the shoulder and weighs between 600 and 1,000 pounds. The smaller females, or cows, weigh 500 to 600 pounds. The sight of a herd is a special moment to remember, if you could beat the crowds. But before we get to the interview, here's the stats. Elk State Forest is a 217,000 acre forest located in Elk, Cameron, Potter, and McKean counties. Available activities include hiking, mountain biking, horseback riding, picnicking, fishing, hunting, camping, sightseeing, snowmobiling, and cross-country skiing. A notable feature of the park is its free-roaming elk herd. Elk State Forest derives its name from the great numbers of elk that once thrived in the area. The last native elk was killed in Pennsylvania in 1867. Between 1913 and 1926, elk from the Rocky Mountains were reintroduced to the area. The herd today is over 600 animals. Nearby towns include Benzinet, St. Mary's, and Driftwood. State parks that are close by include Parker Dam, S.B. Elliott, and Bendingo State Parks. You may enjoy the park if you enjoy seeing beautiful animals in their natural settings. I'm excited to welcome Joe Keller to the podcast. Joe is the District Forester for Elk State Forest. Joe, thanks for joining the program. It's great to be with you this morning, Christian. How would you describe Elk State Forest to somebody who's never been there before? Uh, the Elk State Forest is one of the majestic areas, I would say, of Pennsylvania. Um, it's wild character, even during the logging boom that occurred in the early 1900s, that wild character has actually returned to the second growth forest. Um, we got a plethora of wildlife that we'll talk about later on, I believe. Um, but overall, I would say it's majestic and still wild and untamed. What do you love most about the state forest? The state forest has a, a diversity, diversity of ecosystems, diversity of timber stand types, the wildlife. Um, we have Pennsylvania wild elk herd here. We have fishers. Um, they're talking about possibly reintroducing the American Martin. Um, so overall, it's, it's actually the diversity that makes us so unique, I think, from the rest of the state. The recreational amenities that we're able to offer uh, to the users. Uh, we're actually looking at doing some adaptive uh, recreational amenities here with our uh, sister agency, State Parks, to try to see what we have in the area. So we're, we're trying to open up our portfolio, so to speak, for the users. Is there something everyone should experience when they visit? I would, I would just the, the breathtaking beauty of the area, um, the all-inspiring wild character that we have. I mean, we have the Quahanna Wild Area, um, a huge area that was set aside by legislation. Um, it's probably one of the most vast areas, even though there's road systems there, it's probably one of the vast, vastest areas that we have in Pennsylvania. Um, th literally, there's an adventure waiting for everyone, I would say, um, no matter the age group, um, gender, you know, that type of thing. Um, I, I think our, our state forest as a whole offers something for everyone. Well, let's talk a little bit about what they have to offer. Visitors have their choice of a lot of different activities during all four seasons in the state forest. What are some of the things visitors can do? We have uh, hiking trails, biking, uh, mountain or gravel riding. And again, I mentioned that adaptive uh, amenities that we're working on uh, rolling out. 
we have picnic areas. We actually have two pavilions that were just redone. They were actually initially built by the CCCs. Um, we just redid those about three years ago. They're up along Ridge Road, a scenic drive that we have that has a little over a half dozen vistas along it. We, own, we have three camping areas that we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, one set of, two of those are set aside for equine camping, and then the other one's set aside for just general public camping. Try to separate those that know about horses and those that don't. Uh, we have canoe and kayak launches throughout the, the state forest along the river systems, and then up also on some private lands. And again, we're working with state parks to see whether or not we can get some adaptive launches in for those with disabilities. Uh, fishing in our rivers and lakes, uh, First Fork um, to our east here, it, up above Cinnamonian State Park has trophy fishing area, uh, fly fishing. We have snowmobiling in the winter when, when snow is conducive for that um, activity. We also have cross country skiing, snowshoeing, Wildlife viewing is probably one of the biggest amenities that we have, um, again, just because of the, the plethora of, of wildlife that we have here, both big game species as well as birding. There's birders that come um, from all over just to see some of the, we have tundra species that actually migrate through. Horseback riding, we currently have a 53 mile equestrian trail down around the Benazet area. Um, that was developed decades ago and it's been Probably within the last decade, we revamped some of it, did some rerouting on that. But it, it offers users um, that bring their own horses, that bring their own horses in, um, an opportunity to ride amongst the elk herd. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty unique because the horses actually can get a little closer. We don't, um, we ask the users not to ride up on the elk, but at the same time, it offers that opportunity. Scenic driving, I mentioned the Ridge Trail with the vistas off of it, but the district as a whole has a lot of scenic beauty. Um, if you can dream it, we pretty much uh, offer it. And if we don't, I know the area in general adjacent to us probably does. You brought up the elk herd. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Tell us about the elk herd in the forest. How many are there? How do they come to be in the area in Pennsylvania? So the Pennsylvania elk herd that is currently present with us um, it's actually, it's um, separated out in some satellite herds, which were great to see. The initial population really got its foothold in the Benazet area. They were reintroduced in the early 1900s by a cooperation between the Pennsylvania Game Commission and at that time, the Pennsylvania Department of Forest and Waters. Um, they were introduced in 10 counties, I believe, here in the north central area, but through um, Problems with agriculture, in other words, the elk were getting into croplands and stuff, and, and farmers were, were, were shooting them. Um, the elk herd actually brought or, or kind of regressed back into what we call Cameron and Elk County, so that traditional elk range. So it went from those 10 introductory counties back to those two. So that's where the core resides now. Um, Benazet is the primary, um, we call that kind of the show herd, so to speak. Um, but it has migrated into satellite herds. Um, elk can be currently found in Cattle Creek State Park area, the Cinnamahoning um, State Park area, as well as north of that up in the Costello and Wharton, just south of Austin. We have a herd just south here of Emporium on a lime timber easement that we acquired. It's a 9,000 acre easement that we manage. It's privately owned land, but we manage it for recreational purposes. Um, so, and then, uh, of course, over in St. Mary's area down in Kersey um, are the primary areas for elk viewing. During this time of year, we'll say mid-August through October um, is the, the rut for the elk. You'll hear male, male bulls bugling, um, showing their dominance through sparring challenges with one another. They'll be starting to assemble what they call their harems where they get one bull will start to gather cows up for the breeding season. Um, our, the area gets, gets pretty popular this time of year. Um, it's, our population probably goes from just a couple thousand to hundreds of thousands, especially down in that Benazet area. On a, on a given weekend, it's 
it's like a football game, an NFL game kind of letting out on some of the backcountry roads. Elk are native to Pennsylvania. Why did they need to be reintroduced? Um, it was just one of those collaborative things that the Pennsylvania Game Commission, um, again, back at the turn of the century, identified elk as one of the one of the species that they thought that they could get reintroduced. Um, we had the land base up in this area. A lot of land base that they need, elk are a grazer. Um, so they needed more fo forage. So we were able, and the Game Commission was able to um, acquire some old strip lands, coal strippings that were up in this area. They rehab those strippings, uh, reclaim those strip areas, and were able to revegetate them into grass species that the elk actually thrive on. Some of the other things that were done is, again, at the turn of the century, there were failed clear cuts from the over harvest of timber and then wildfires. And some of those areas didn't really regenerate back to what um, was conducive or was able to be a viable managed tree species. So some of those areas were kind of hand picked out and turned into food plots throughout the forest so that those elk could actually migrate out in the forest to more of a natural setting as they were in, reintroduced. What was the main reason for elk to no longer be prevalent in Pennsylvania in the 1800s and the early 1900s? Was it just overhunting? It, it was overhunting. As humans, we we tend to overuse some of the resources we had before we truly understand them. And, and elk was one of those species that was over harvested, much like our timber in this area and all of Pennsylvania, to help fuel the nation at the time. Um, and again, it's, it's great to see that resource back here in the Northeast. Um, I highly recommend that if, if, if you really want to experience nature at its fullest to visit the elk State Forest, and again, that Benazet or our area in general during that rut, um, it is definitely a, a bucket list type thing. If you've never heard elk bugle in the wild on a foggy morning, it is definitely something to see and hear. What kind of hiking trails are there in the safe forest and do you have a trail recommendation? So we offer both long distance and like day use type trails. So long distance would be something that uh, backpackers would come in with, with all their supplies. They could backpack in, camp along those trails. Some of the long distance trails we offer are like the bucktail path where people can backpack in and camp along it. Another one that's highly recommended is the Quahana Trail. That trail actually traverses through the Elk State Forest and the Machinan State Forest. Um, but that, again, that's a backpack type style trail. We also offer day use or day type trails, just shorter trail, loop trails or linear trails um, that, that individuals can hike. And again, we're still looking into that. I, I keep bringing up that adaptive type trail systems. We're looking more into that um, across the landscape. One of the nice things that we have here locally is the West Creek Rail Trail. It actually connects Emporium to St. Mary's. During the summer months, that trail is used for hiking and biking. And in the winter months, um, we've seen cross-country skiers along it, as well as the snowmobiles traversing. If a visitor has a weekend to explore the forest, what do you recommend they do? One of the biggest things we try to recommend is um, developing an itinerary. Don't just drive here, um, get an uh, Airbnb or a hotel, whatever you may do over in St. Mary's, and just come to try to explore. I highly recommend trying to develop an itinerary so you can maximize your time because there is so much to see. And when you're developing that itinerary, we strongly suggest that you have both um, fair weather type adventures as well as rainy day type adventures. Um, and one of the things we suggest during the rainy season, if it were a rainy day, is the Elk Country Visitor Center up on Winslow Hill, just outside of Benazet. It's a beautiful facility that's run by the Keystone Elk Country Alliance. It has displays of wildlife. Um, there's elk mounts. There's a movie theater that kind of tells the history of elk and its management. Um, and, and, it, and sometimes they actually have class classroom activities up there. Uh, where they're actually, you know, explaining things a little more detail to the general public and their visitors. Yeah, I'm sure that kind of goes doubly for people that only have a day. If you only have a day there, don't kind of wing it. Make sure you have a plan in place. If you really want to hike, these are the trails you want to hike. If you really want to mountain bike, these are the places you want to mountain bike. Absolutely. And, and we, you know, if you can't find anything on DCNR's main website, if you look for the Elk State Forest 
for our sister districts, the Michigan State Forest, just next to the south of us, um, or the Sproul, which is a little bit southeast of us, or the Susquehanna, which is more northeast of us. Um, and, and again, there's parks dotted throughout there if you're a camper um, or there's cabin colonies that they rent out. Um, we strongly suggest going to the website, trying to pull yourself together an itinerary again so that you can maximize your experience. The local communities also have, um, if you're looking at Emporium, St. Mary's, Ridgeway, some of those communities actually have big festivals throughout the year too. So, you know, again, researching those and pulling that into your, your trip, you know, mix a little bit of culture with the actual wild is, is a great great avenue and a great experience. Joe, you spend a lot of time in the forest. What's your favorite thing to do at Elk State Forest? Honestly, my favorite thing to do is explore. Um, I've been in the district now 16 years and I still haven't even touched um, even a, a half of the district. Um, there's so much to offer. We have areas where there's waterfalls. Uh, we have beautiful scen scenic vistas, like I mentioned before. The mountain streams up here for fishermen that are, you know, the native trout species, brook trout, brown trout. Um, it's absolutely amazing to be able to see what we have here to offer. Again, the elk herd, just, just walking through the forest and hearing the elk bugle is something magnificent. And if you're able to see two sparring, um, it, it is all inspiring when you hear their antlers crash together. In the springtime, um, we have, I mentioned the game hunting species, wild turkey, gobbling, gobblers are always hammering off the ridge tops, off the points. While a lot of fishermen, that's one thing that I like to do is when I'm fishing on the spring mornings, is when the turkeys are getting ready to mate, those gobblers are up on the ridge lines, just gobbling away. And just to hear that, um, it's kind of nice because it reintroduces us to spring and summer. Whereas the elk viewing season, the elk bugling kind of singles or signifies that, hey, you know, summer's coming to a close, fall's ramping up, and winter's knocking on the door. So it's kind of nice to have those game species that remind us of what we have up here. Well, let's talk about those species. Elk State Forest is open to hunting and fishing. What sort of animals can be found in the area of uh, Pennsylvania? So the Elk State Forest offers all big game species, uh, white-tailed deer, black bear, uh, wild turkeys. The elk are actually hunted. Um, it's currently in the low, I believe, between 1,200 and 1,500 in the herd. But the Pennsylvania Game Commission does a lottery system to harvest so many of those animals, bulls and cows so that they can continue to manage the habitat for them. Um, they don't want to over, they don't want the population to get too large that they start having problems, um, diseases and stuff like that occurring. But as of right now, they have a lottery system. The elk herd itself, again, I mentioned that it's kind of spread out. So they have different harvest areas for that. Um, so that, that hunt for the elk usually occurs in November for the rifle season. They do have an archery season now. But again, I mentioned white-tailed deer, black bear, wild turkeys. Uh, we actually have snowshoe hare up in the north um, northwestern part of our district. There's some stands up in there that have some snowshoe hare, which is pretty, pretty rare in Pennsylvania. They're actually doing some research on that. One of the species that I know some people get a little nervous about are rattlesnakes. So we do have venomous rattlesnakes in our area. We just ask that, you know, just keep an eye out for them. If you don't bother them, they usually don't bother you. Um, they're just like any other animal. They don't want to be disturbed or bothered. Uh, if you do hear one, just identify where it's at, slowly back away from it and just leave it be. Again, one of the things that we try to preach is, you know, take pictures because they last longer, so to speak. And I think there's something out there along that lines rather than like picking our wildflowers leave those wildflowers there um, to seed in because once that's picked it might not be able to seed in um, it's the same with I, I preach that to my my kids about fishing so what we have here are brook trout and brown trout in our cool mountain streams with the hemlock woolly adelgi taking a lot of the hemlocks off away from those stream systems. It's allowing the water temperatures to rise, so it's a little harder to manage those species. But so we, we asked the fishermen, if you're not familiar with fishing the mountain streams, to try to 
refrain from fishing them in the in the hot days of summer because it stresses the fish out a little bit more. So the springtime or, or fall is a better time for fishing of those stream systems. But again, take lots of pictures. Um, they, they last a lot longer than you know picking them or harvesting them and putting them in your freezer if it's a fish if you're carrying them into consuming them. Elk State Forest has miles of mountain biking trails, cross-country skiing, and horseback riding. How popular are those activities in the forest? So I mentioned the West Crick Rail Trail. Um, that's one of the uh, really good introductory if people aren't familiar with just biking in general. It's a flat railroad grade type, kind of like the Pine Creek Rail Trail. It's not as long as the rail trail. It is um, along State Route 120 for a short portion, so it's close to road systems, if people aren't comfortable riding out, maybe in, in the mountain area, mountainous areas right off the bat. But then we, we are in the process of developing gravel trail or gravel biking type loops throughout the state forest. Um, we do have a couple areas. I mentioned Ridge Trail. It's kind of a rolly terrain. Um, if you start at the top, we have several parking areas along there. If you're more adventurous, there's some gently sloping climbs. Um, that we have coming from the base of the valley up onto the ridge tops, and and then we also have a couple extreme challenge challenges throughout the district that we're going to start pulling into some of those trail layouts. Um, that we hope to uh, we're going to be working on that in the winter time, and hopefully by spring those are on our on our website for the individuals to enjoy. Um, as far as horseback riding, I mentioned. Our Thunder Mountain Equestrian Trail, that Thunder Mountain Equestrian Trail is a 53 mile trail. It's on our, what we call Z3 roads, our gated roads. It's on some Z2 roads, which are motorized, but they're not taken care of as well as our public use roads or Z1 roads. They're usually limestone. And then we have um, some single track, or essentially it's an eight foot blade that went through and we tied some of the old woods roads together, or maybe an old railroad grade. But that 53 mile trail um, can be accessed from our two trailheads at the Gaswell or Dark Hollow camping areas. Um, there's 15 sites together at those two, two areas. Um, they book up really fast in the fall. If you're planning to come up and camp, again, you have to bring your own horses. Um, but there's also a campground called Big Elk Lick down to the east of Benazette. Big Elk Lick offers equine camping as well. Um, I don't know if they rent horses out per se, but um, that campground actually, we built a connector into our Thunder Mountain Equestrian Trail. So they're able to, to access the Southern part of our trail system from that camping area. Like many areas of Pennsylvania, Elk State Forest has been impacted by mass deforestation that occurred in the past. Logs from the forest were floated down branches of the Cinnamahoning Creek and used all over the world until the last of the timber was cut in the early 1900s. Then came wildfires. How has the park rebounded and what kinds of trees can visitors encounter? The Elk State Forest, when it was deforested at the turn of the century, was primarily made up of white pine and hemlock forest. Um, we, were not, we were lucky enough to get a northern hardwood mix as well as mixed oak species in our district. So again, I talked about that diversity. The northern part of our district is primarily northern hardwood species. We got maples, uh, black birch, white pine, hemlock. And then on the southern part of our district, we have a mixed oak species. We have white oak stands, red oak stands. There's some um, pitch pine mixed in with those stands as well in the drier sites. Uh, a lot of huckleberry and, and mountain laurel, that type of thing. Um, the one unique thing about our area um, that a lot of people I don't think recognize, and I didn't until I started working here, is the, is the history that this area has. It wasn't just the timber that was harvested here, but there was coal that was harvested. It was actually cooked off in the coke ovens um, down along one of the stream systems here. You can actually still find remnants of those coke ovens. There's a museum down outside of Sterling Run. They call it the Little Museum, but it has an example of that coke oven. Um, we have drift mines where they, the people used to mine the coal out of the, the hillsides. Another unique thing of this area is they used to make dynamite in this area. Um, so a lot of the real narrow hollows and stuff, you'll find where they actually cut out areas and they use those cut out areas to store the dynamite. So that if, if something happened to that dynamite or it exploded, 
it would just blow out straight as opposed to, to injuring anyone. Um, so there's a lot of rich history in this area, just down this down from Emporium here in the Driftwood area is where the Bucktail Regiment that fought in the Civil War um, assembled. Um, they actually, I believe, assembled up in McKean County, but the Driftwood was one of the stops where they where they acquired some more individuals to sign up into those ranks. So the Bucktail Regiment is from up in this area. So the area is rich with history. So it's not just the forest, not just the animals, but the history that lends itself to not just our state, Pennsylvania, and its, its growth and nurturing, but also the nation as a whole. Elk State Forest has seven separate wild and natural areas. They're set aside to protect unique or unusual biologic, geologic, scenic, and historical features or to showcase outstanding examples of the state's major forest communities. Do you have a favorite one that you would steer visitors toward? Uh, my favorite one would actually be the Quahana Wild Area. Again, it's, it's so vast up there. Um, and just to, again, I talked about the history of the area. The Quahana Wild Area was actually set aside um, during the Curtis Wright Corporation to test jet engines um, and for nuclear research. So again, I didn't know that until I, you know, started working here, but that area has some major significance to the growth of our nation and our state. Um, some of the more interesting areas, you, you mentioned that we have a lot of natural and wild areas, but some of them are small enough. So I mentioned the pine tree natural area. The pine tree natural area is just a small natural area of old growth forest that we have um, outside of just to the east of Benazet along off of five, State Route 555. Um, but that area, you know, we talk, we think about natural areas and wild areas being these bad, vast um, expanses not necessarily all of them. So I guess what I'm getting at is some people might be excited to go explore Quahana because that's an area that I appreciate and love. But if you're not familiar with being out in the woods and in the wilderness, I would I would suggest visiting like Pine Tree Trail. It's a smaller natural area. There's roads on both sides. So your chances of getting lost are a lot less. So, you know, be within your comfort zone when you come explore, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. There are several scenic vistas in the state forest. Do you have a vista recommendation for visitors to check out? Yes, so, so the majority of our vistas are right along Ridge Road. Um, Ridge Road is to the, it would be to the east of State uh, 120 and 155 here out of Emporium. Emporium is kind of the center hub where those two roads come off of. Um, but Ridge, Ridge Road has, like I said, about a half a dozen, a little over a half a dozen vistas that are along that edge. And my recommendation would be starting at the Salt Run Vista. Um, it's the northernmost vista that we have. It's off of Crooked, or it's off of Ridge Road, but you can access it off of Crooked Run Road, just outside of Sizerville State Park. And then you can just traverse or drive Ridge Road southward, um, and you'll come across countless vistas. There's also, I mentioned those two picnic pavilions that were re rehabbed in those areas. Uh, you'll, you'll pass Hicks, or Hunts Run Pavilion as well as our Norcross Vista Pavilion. Let's get a little bit more into what camping sites are available. What can people experience if they want to go camping in the state forest? So we, we talked about long distance hiking and backpacking. So there's that option where people usually backpack in away from their vehicles. Um, in an overnight capacity in one, usually one night in one spot, and then they continue hiking. So we have that type of backpacking or primitive backpacking that we offer. We, we ask that if anybody's planning on doing that, to just let our office know, you know, if you're planning on a trip, just let us know when you're going to be there, where you're planning on parking. This allows us, if there's any type of emergency where we have to come look for our visitors, um, if a family member calls in or something like that, looking for someone, we know where to at least get started. Um, again, it's a vast area up here. Getting emergency response out to some of these areas is a little bit challenging at times. So that's part of that itinerary and planning purposes if you're going to do any of that um, primitive backpacking. We do offer motorized uh, group camping, essentially designated sites. We have what we call the Hicks Run camping area it's located on the west branch of hicks run 
It's about 2.2 miles northwest of route, State Route 555. The facility offers 15 designated sites, four non-electric camping tent sites, and 11 non-electric motorized. Again, this is a primitive camping area, so there's no running water. It is a pet latrine, but each site has a picnic table, a fire ring, um, and again, the site's designated. We also have the Dark Hollow. I mentioned the, these two equine camping areas. The Dark Hollow um, camping area has 10 non-electric motorized sites, and the gas well has five non-electric motorized equestrian camping areas. Um, along Bell Draft Road, about five and a quarter miles from Benazette, these camping areas offer equestrian users a total of 15 designated sites through a first come, first serve permit system. Um, camping at our designated sites is, has now been rolled in. This is for all Bureau of Forestry, has now been rolled into the state park reservation system. So we, we just ask visitors um, when they want to do a reservation to, to get on our website, DCNAR's website, go to the reservation link, and they're able to find a phone number to call into that reservation section. Monday through Saturday, they can call in or they can get online seven days a week and, and reserve a spot. And catch them early because they go fast. Yes, they do, especially, and I will say, especially during the elk viewing season up here at August and October window. There's, it's, it's nice. One of the things I will point out is there's a lot of private campgrounds that have actually um, developed down along that State Route 555 corridor, just in Benazet and to the west of Benazet, or to the east of Benazet, excuse me. Um, so if our sites aren't available, I strongly recommend that people look into those areas as well. Do you think there's a best time to visit Elk State Forest? Our, our busiest season would be mid-August through the end of October, as I mentioned, for that uh, individuals coming to see the elk. I don't really, I think that's probably the best time for visitors to come, but again, be prepared for the crowd, so to speak. It, it depends on what, what you're interested in. If you like the warm summer months and hiking, um, you're going to have some bugs out there. And again, the rattlesnakes are more active in the summer months. But at the same time, you know, every every season that we have here in north central Pennsylvania is absolutely beautiful and breathtaking. Um, I, I will say that there's not one season that I dislike. Um, each one has something special to offer. And just seeing that seasonal change, if you're someone that likes, you know, to come back to an area to see what activities you can do in the winter and then maybe some that you can do in the summer and then back in the fall. We definitely have that, we have that portfolio, so to speak, to be able to draw from. And the PA Wilds itself, I mean, the PA Wilds area has so much to lend um, visitors. I would also suggest that I, I think people tend to think that forests and parks just shut down in the winter, like they're not available. There's a lot of beauty to be found in state forests and state parks in the winter. And there's a ton of activities from snowshoeing to cross-country skiing so if you want solitude you can also come back in the winter that's right and in this it's it's amazing you brought up the solitude like our bird species that migrate south um, for the winter if, if the wind is dead calm and you go out in some of these ridges or in the valleys i mean you can literally hear your heartbeat um, it is so quiet i mean you can hear mountain streams running that are probably a quarter mile away from you just just because it is so quiet and the, and the leaves, the foliage is pretty much off the trees or is off the trees. So the sounds travel so much further. Um, it, it's absolutely amazing. Do you have any tips for people who plan on visiting the forest? Again, I mentioned developing that trip itinerary uh, maximizes your time and accounts for uncertain weather and into account for uncertain weather conditions. The other thing I mentioned earlier is, you know, stay within your wheelhouse, stay within what you're comfortable with and work into some of the more extreme challenges. You know, if you're just starting out, you know, you don't want to burn yourself out. You don't want to um, scare yourself away, I guess, so to speak, if, you, if something happens during your visit where you're not comfortable. Um, so slowly progress into what you want to tackle, what you want to experience. Um, I was born and raised in the hills up here. I can remember going out myself 
Um, when my dad would take me out on hikes or I'd go out with my family, and when they say, just stay right here, I'll be right back, I can remember that uneasy feeling even on a beautiful sunny day. But it, it took me time, and I mean, I love going out in the woods by myself now. Um, one of the things I will say is, if you do decide to go on a backpacking trip or you are going somewhere, um, maybe off the beaten path, just let somebody know where you're going. Again, that helps the emergency responders in the area. It helps us to be able to find you quickly if something does happen. Um, accidents happen, things happen, um, but we just wanna you know, be as proactive as we can and, and keeping everybody safe on your visit. I'm also going to generally assume that you probably don't have great cell coverage up there. That is an awesome point, Christian. Our cell coverage is uh, zero. <laughs> <laughs> you can find it occasionally on a ridge top, but for the most part, don't rely on your cell phones. Again, that's a uh, that's great point. That's another one of those reasons to make sure that you plan accordingly. Um, don't just think that you're going to be able to use your Google Earth and find out where you're at because you're not necessarily going to be able to do that. Print a map. Download yep. maps offline and uh, take a little bit. Uh, you know what? DCNR offers uh, orienteering classes so you can learn how to use a compass appropriately. And if you're going to be spending a lot of time outdoors or exploring a state forest, you should probably learn how to get around safely. Absolutely. And we started um, some of our brochure maps that we have here in the district. We started putting QR codes on them so people can actually link right to them directly. So um, we're trying to use technology to the best of our ability with what is what is um available in our area um so yeah people should definitely come prepared and we're trying to work with the local community um to develop maybe some outfitters in the area that are willing to take people out um, so that people feel a little more comfortable same with biking we're trying to get some of the biking trails established like i said on maps um, i think there's ride with gps is one of the the tools that's out there we're trying to get some of those trails um, listed on that but until we can catch up with the technology or get things rolled into that, um, just just come prepared, I guess. And again, don't push the envelope your first time out. Joe, thanks so much for talking to us today. I uh, we really appreciate it. Absolutely, Christian. I appreciate you. You know, having us on the on the podcast. And if you have any other questions, or if any of the users that hear this podcast have any questions, feel free to call the Elk State Forest, our district office here in North Central Pennsylvania, uh, 814-486-3353. Again, 814-486-3353. Or visit DCNR's website. Uh, there's, a, again, a plethora of information on there for both state force systems, the 20 districts across the state, and our sister agency, Bureau of State Parks. I want to thank my guest, Joe Keller, for joining the podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook for more information about upcoming episodes. You can support the podcast by buying merch or donating on our website. This has been Hemlocks to Hellbenders. I'll see you out there. Hosting, production, and editing by Christian Alexanderson. Music by John Sauer. Graphics by Uncle Traveling Matt's Random Expedition.